All right, let there be light. Yes. The very, the very first piece of advice I ever got as a speaker was from Jason Scott, and he said, never start your talk on time, because people don't get there uh, punctually. So I've been, I've been helped in this regard to, to follow through on his advice by having to find out how to turn these lights on. Um, but I am going to start pretty much on time, since I have a lot of material. Um, and also, it's like nine in the morning, so you know I don't know how how many people we really can expect to drag themselves out of bed at this time. I thank you all very much for being the brave few that attend a nine o'clock hacking conference talk, this, which is just a thing that shouldn't exist. Um, all right, so my talk is about um, sensor, the sensor and logic attack surface of driverless vehicles, and I'm also including connected vehicles in that category. I just want you know you to think about something just for a second about how great IoT security is and the fact that driverless vehicles are basically IoT devices that weigh thousands of kilograms and can cause all kinds of physical damage and destruction. Um, but I, with that said, I'm not going to be focused on network attacks because vehicles are not special um, in that sense. Um, and I'm not going to focus on attacks that require a foothold inside the platform. Most of the car hacking stuff that you see uh, involves physically plugging in uh, to the OBD port and injecting packets on the CAN bus or else maybe breaking in through, uh, through Bluetooth or something like that. Um, once you have a fo foothold on the platform, it's well known there's all kinds of havoc that you can wreak. So I'm not going to focus on that. I'm really going to focus, as it says, on the, uh, on the sensors and the logic structures involved in, in unmanned systems. Um, my experience uh, is as a robotics engineer, and uh, here are just a couple of cool projects that I worked on. Um, this was one of the first uh, autonomous delivery drones uh, that delivered a life-saving, um, like an, an inflatable lifesaver to a swimmer in trouble out in the ocean. Um, and that's where I learned a lot about how easy it is to, to crash UAVs and the sort of iterative nature of UAV design. Um, and then also I did uh, some autonomous pizza delivery way back before Domino's did it uh, and claimed that they were the first. Um, so I did local pizza delivery with a um, self-balancing two-wheel vehicle uh, for going along the sidewalks and then also uh, long-distance pizza delivery in a, in a vehicle which was involved the first ever autonomous crossing of a United States highway bridge, which, you know, is like a, it's a pretty niche first ever, but it's still a first ever. Um, but, again, with that said, uh, where, where do people think the very first driverless car was developed and tested? Um, who thinks the United States? Anyone? Good. Yeah, it's not the United States. Um, and when do you think it was done? Um, <laughs> later than that, but um, 2000s? 90s? Um, well, this technology was developed first in Germany. Um, and in the 80s, 1986, um, by the laboratory of Ernst Dickmans. And the vehicle was called Vamors. Um, and uh, it was like a you know, fully, fully driverless van. And in 1995, they drove Munich to Copenhagen in full regular traffic, up to 175 kilometers per hour, using just computer vision. So cameras only. So OK, this stuff's over 30 years old. Why do we care about it? You know. Is it, is it kind of like hacking Windows 3.1, right? You know, just the curiosity. No, there's like all kinds of stuff being developed um, and things are getting more complex. So um, here's some just European stuff that's happening in the driverless vehicle space. Um, in the UK, the, uh, Nissan has been testing autonomous LEAF electric vehicles in London since 2017. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover has been doing testing on public roads. And the UK government has promised 200 million pounds as a research fund. So that's at least a few thousand euros after Brexit. Um, in Sweden, the uh, Gothenburg has been doing driverless Volvo testing uh, 2017 through 2018. Um, Northern Stockholm uh, approved an autonomous bus service in 2018. Um, in Germany, of course, lots of work going on. BMW is testing 40 vehicles in Munich. Um, they're promising they're going to sell an autonomous electric vehicle that will self-drive on the Autobahn in 2021. And uh, they're testing an autonomous bus um, at a Berlin hospital and in Bavaria. Uh, France is doing automated shuttles in Paris and um, has passed some legislation to do open road testing. And the EU uh, is coming, finishing off the final year of uh, uh, the initial phase of Project Autopilot, which was a 25 million euro uh, grant for autonomous vehicles um, in six cities. So super relevant over this side of the pond. Um, 
And so this kind of stuff is, is eventually going to be on, a, on our streets and so on um, because we have a lot of energy efficiency advantages uh, for not having to haul a human driver. Um, the fact that these things can operate without rest breaks um, and that they enable new kinds of applications. Um, so in addition to transportation, um, oceanography is a, is a huge application. Um, mapping, uh, filmmaking has already embraced drones a lot. Um, weird applications like power line inspection. There's, um, you know, millions of miles of power lines that need to be inspected. Um, and of course, moving stuff around. Um, so here's another uh, example that maybe you know, cause, because the cars get all the press and, and the aerial drones, people don't think about shipping so much. Um, but this is likely to be a big deal because you have to move a lot of stuff around on the ocean. And, um, you know, having, having a crew on board is uh, not only an extra expense, but it's dangerous. 75% of maritime accident, accidents are caused by human error. Um, so if we can get autonomous cargo ships going, uh, that'll, that'll save a lot of hassles. Uh, but of course, you have to deal with one major technical challenge of not having a crew on board is what if something breaks, right? So um, ships often have like full machine shops on board to fix things. So that's uh, sort of an interesting question. Um, but here's a real, real world example. Uh, Kongsberg just announced a ship called the Yara Birkeland, which is going to be a zero emission electric ship and autonomous capable. So they're estimating that this cargo ship will replace 40,000 annual truck trips. Um, and they have a plan for how they're going to roll it out. They're going to uh, run it manned in 2020 and test it and make sure it all works. Uh, down crew it to a skeleton crew in 2021. And they're anticipating fully autonomous uh, ferry trips of stuff on this ship uh, by 20, in 2022. Um, the industry priorities for these applications uh, are precision agriculture um, and self-driving cars. That's where they think sort of all the money is going to be in this. Um, and the roadblocks, uh, the things that, you know, because obviously we've been able to do this kind of stuff, at least experimentally since the 80s. Why don't we have roads full of autonomous vehicles now? It's because we have to share that infrastructure. Um, roads, of course, airspace, so we have to make sure that uh, the unpredictable humans that are still on the road and still flying in the air don't get crashed into. Um, and the fact that the public feels nervous about this kind of stuff, you know, sitting, sitting, uh, imagine taking a flight uh, on an autonomous jetliner and just knowing there's no one in the cockpit um, to deal with problems. If they happen, that would make a lot of pe people nervous, um, even though the ultimate cause of the, uh, most aviation crashes is also pilot error. But anyway, speaking of, uh, of, of errors and failures, let's get into how things go wrong. So um, here is a, a classic failure from, uh, you know, the, the, the early American efforts in uh, self-driving vehicles. Um, there was a thing called the DARPA Grand Challenge, which was a desert, an autonomous desert race from Los Angeles to Las Vegas back in 2004. And this was considered to be the favorite uh, to win that race. Uh, it was a Carnegie Mellon University project called Sandstorm. And everyone thought this is going to win or at least get the furthest. Um, and well, what happened? Uh, it went you can see it there uh, taking off. And it got a few miles only um, on these uh, hundreds of miles course from Los Angeles to Las Vegas uh, before it took a sharp turn incorrectly, ran off the side of the road, and caught fire. So you can see there in the, in the video uh, the burning vehicle. Here's an aerial shot of it. Super embarrassing, right? Everyone thought this vehicle was going to win. Uh, well, what was the problem? The problem was that DARPA really wanted this contest to be successful. So they told the teams a, a day or two in advance the exact route that they uh, should take to go on this race. And so this team was a big team. They'd, they walked that whole route, and they GPS mapped the whole thing to high fidelity. But then they didn't run the course with GPS only. They ran it using their other sensors. And on that turn, they decided to, the robot decided to believe the sensors, and it, so it took the turn wrong uh, and crashed. So this is, a, this is an insight here because it means that deciding what the vehicle knows is a constant battle. You know, it's getting all this information, um, and it needs to do correct state estimation in order to uh, make good decisions. So attacks or exploits of these vehicles uh, will most likely somehow subvert that state estimation process. Um, here's another one from a, a, more, a more recent failure. Um, 
that uh, unfortunately killed a person. This is a fatal uh, accident involving the Tesla autopilot uh, last year uh, on the on the highway. And what happened here was um, the car was in a mode where it was doing basically dynamic cruise control, so that means following the car in front of it, and auto steer based on lane information. And so it was following the car in front, and it came to a divider in the highway where the lane markings were not good. And if it had followed the car in front, it would have been fine. If it had followed uh, the lane markings to the other side, it would have been fine. But it dithered and crashed into a crash barrier at 120 kilometers per hour um, with enough force uh, to pretty much destroy the vehicle and also run into other vehicles on the road too. Um, so you know, it selected these poor lane markings for just long enough to stay in the middle of this highway split. Um, so this is another insight about how these systems fail. Uh, it's because the decision making in many cases ex is extremely fragile and there are lots and lots of edge cases. The whole, the whole thing is basically edge cases. Um, just like, uh, you know, we, we model all kinds of software. We can model the logic structures in autonomous vehicles as a hierarchy. Um, so at the bottom of the hierarchy, we have all of our control loops, uh, maintaining stability, that kind of thing, uh, depending on the vehicle. But for example, uh, an autonomous helicopter has uh, very complicated control loops to, because it is not a dynamically stable platform. Um, once we have control of our vehicle, uh, we want to not run into things. So we have a collision avoidance layer. Um, once we've got those things covered, uh, we want to do navigation, getting from point A to point B, and knowing where those points are, localization as well. And then above all of that, we have our high-level uh, mission planners and logic. So because this is hierarchical, um, if we can subvert something lower in the stack, they defeat everything above. You know, if the, if the vehicle runs into something, it can't navigate. Um, However, that means more engineering effort is probably spent on guaranteed robustness at the lower levels. So the lower levels are juicier targets, but they're also harder targets. Uh, here's just the two examples that I gave right at the beginning. Uh, the life-saving drone. Um, we've got uh, PID loops um, on all of the uh, control axes of the aircraft um, that are tuned for the maximum environmental conditions we expect. Right? So some maximum wind gust speed above which we would not be safe to fly. Um, no collision avoidance whatsoever, um, and navigation localization is all done with GPS following a circuit of waypoints, and then the high-level mission planner is to set up this kind of bombing run that would in, uh, estimate the impact point and fly in and drop the life preserver to the person who's in trouble. So the first thing we notice here, extremely vulnerable to collision, um, and secondly, the high-level logic depends on one single sensor. Where, have we, where has that been in the news lately? the Boeing 737 MAX, right? So we had two uh, fatal full airframe, airframe losses because um, it had a system that was activated uh, on the failure of a single sensor. Um, the pizza delivery, I'm going to use the self-balancing uh, short-range pizza delivery as an example um, it's because the control loops are more interesting. So we have this dynamic balancing and weight shifting, including when a pizza gets removed from the system, it has to rebalance to make sure because now the uh, moment arm on the top of that robot is different. Um, this one's all about collision avoidance. So it's dynamically mapping constantly um, and uh, deciding whether obstacles are static or dynamic and avoiding them. Um, navigation and localization does route planning based on a SLAM, uh, simultaneous localization and mapping sensor map that's generated by its primary sensor. And then, of course, the, the high-level mission is to get the pizza to the right place, and only give it to the person who, who has ordered it. So there's a credit card check to authenticate the pizza delivery. Um, so this type of platform is vulnerable to redirection, trapping, and map confusion attacks because it's building its own map. So um, let's take a look at uh, the types of sensors um, that we expect to see on an autonomous vehicle. Um, uh, two different basic types of sensors, active and passive. Uh, active send out information into the world and then retrieve the results. Passive just collect information from the world itself. Um, so common things you'll see on an autonomous platform, of course, are GPS, often mounted there on the roof. Um, LiDAR, which is a basically a scanning laser rangefinder. Uh, cameras, uh, millimeter wave radar, um, usually are mounted on the front and back of the vehicle. Uh, ultrasonic transducers, mostly used for parking. 
um, a digital compass, so that you know have a, have a uh, uh, an absolute heading reference, um, inertial measurement unit, um, encoders on the wheels for odometry, and then things that aren't road vehicles and might have some other sensors. So vehicles under the water um, might have a Doppler velocity logger that give uh, odometry and uh, speed um, if they are able to, see, to acoustically see the bottom, um, a scanning sonar to, to look for objects. Um, and then pressure transducers for depth, or in the case of aerial vehicles, uh, for altitude. So um, I'll talk about relevant attacks on all these sensors, um, but not about attacks that would work equally well on um, human piloted vehicles. So the ones that are just that are mostly good for for confusing uh, and messing with autonomous vehicles. So your sensors don't give you a perfect picture of the world; they give you a best estimate. Um, so there are several certain sources of uncertainty, uh, including noise um, uh, from various sources, electrical, thermal, and so on, um, RF, and drift. So that's the, the change in uh, sensor reading over time. And then also you don't get a reading instantaneously from most sensors. You get it some time after you ask for it, so there's a latency uh, during which the situation may have changed. And then also some sensors you can't query uh, all that often, and so there's an update rate issue as well. So you model that uncertainty under various assumptions, um, and ideally you fuse together the data from multiple sensors, because that can be more useful than uh, the individual sensor alone. But then you run into the problem of what do you do when your senses disagree. Fusion uh, is not an easy task in many cases. So the robustness of your vehicle may come down to, as in the case of the 737 MAX, how smart is it at discounting one failed or actively attacked sensor? Um, two basic kinds of sensor attacks. So you can uh, do denial of service, essentially, which means preventing that sensor from recovering any useful data at all. Um, and then you can spoof them, which is to cause the sensor to retrieve specifically incorrect data that's under the control of the attacker. So you're, you're telling it what bad data to get. Um, and then you have also a choice of basic attack modes. You can just instantaneously attack a sensor um, and try and make it make a bad inference immediately. Um, or you can s sort of slowly try and trick it over time by attacking the way that it aggregates that sensor data. So I'll cover um, most of those sensors from the previous list in order. Um, in the case of GPS, obviously a major uh, reference, a major location reference for many, many things. Um, if you have access to the atmosphere, if you have access to a view of the sky, um, denial is very easy. It's jamming it with RF noise. And so you can go to various sketchy Chinese websites and you can buy a GPS jammer pretty cheaply. Uh, they're mostly illegal to operate, but um, you can still get them. Uh, or you can find schematics online and build your own. Um, you're just building uh, a, you know, a radio transmitter that's pumping out noise at the right frequencies. Um, and to spoof GPS, you need to send out fake GPS satellite signals at a higher power than the real ones. GPS signals are extremely low power, uh, but because the signal is very well characterized, the receivers um, can lock onto this weak signal, but if you can send fake ones out at a higher power, then a receiver will just lock onto those instead. So here's um, an early example, early video example from uh, UT Austin, the Radio Navigation Lab. Um, looking at how they uh, use GPS spoofing when they, it's one of the first demonstrations of the concept uh, to take over UAV. So down the bottom you can see the receiver um, and the signal that it's locking onto and what they're doing is sending out the real signal for a little bit so the receiver locks onto it and then they're moving their fake signal which as you can see is a slightly higher power um, away. So that's going to cause the controller on board the vehicle to adjust. So in their demo, they're going to send out a fake GPS signal that starts to drift upwards, and the automatic controller on the helicopter is going to push the vehicle downwards to compensate for what it senses as a drift upwards. And what that means is um, when the fake signal is being sent, if the uh, remote pilot didn't take control of it, the system would be able to drive that helicopter straight into the ground and the safety pilot takes over just before it gets to the ground. Now, um, 
this is the technique that the Iranians said that they used when they recovered a um, American RQ-170 drone. Um, that claim is almost certainly not true uh, because for two reasons. Firstly, the military GPS signal is encrypted. Uh, and secondly, the military doesn't use it for primary navigation on drones anyway because they know that it's, uh, if, even if not spoofable, it's eminently jammable. So most likely this plane crashed for other reasons, but uh, that certainly was uh, the, th they felt it was plausible enough to claim that they had GPS spoofed it. Um, however, in the civilian realm, uh, we often do use GPS as the primary sensor. Um, often in the case of a uh, your, your sort of standard driverless vehicle, doing GPS and then resolving the last meter or so uh, with the LiDAR, which we'll get to later. Um, now, pretty much every sensor that the vehicle uses has some sort of filter on it. Um, and so the GPS, general, the filter on the GPS uh, navigation system usually slowly kind of drags the vehicle away from an incorrect trajectory. And we can probably see this happening in this footage from the second run of the DARPA Grand Challenge. This was a vehicle called Stanley, and we can see it's driving down a perfectly straight road, but for some reason, it's like dragging itself off the road and then being corrected uh, um, just before it gets off there. So most likely that's a, that's a bad GPS waypoint and it's being dragged off the road and then the LiDAR is dragging it back on. Um, here's another example of what happens when you're only listening to GPS or what can happen. Um, so this vehicle just is completely unaware that it's driving over a Jersey barrier. Um, the big takeaway here for me really is that a van can drive over a Jersey barrier. I, was, I would not have expected that to be the case. Um, not just... Uh, Ground, um, terrestrial ground vehicles, um, also uh, things on the ocean. So the UT Austin Radio Navigation Lab um, did this again with a super yacht. So this um, is the, this yacht is called the White Rose of Drax. I don't know how many millions of dollars it's worth, but I'm sure it's many. Um, away when when these ships are away from visible land, they have no position reference at all during the day, other than GPS because we don't have some of the other radio uh, frequency navigation systems any, anymore. LORAN, which was the last one, has been turned off. So when you're out in the middle of the ocean, if an attacker could send small changes in bearing, they could eventually lead a, uh, a boat to make big position errors. So that's they asked permission from the owners of this yacht, and uh, they gave the permission. And so they set up a system to give it a false heading by about three degrees. Um, and so when the, uh, when the system was under attack, you can see changing by three degrees, and that causes the navigation system on the ship to automatically correct, and now that ship's being directed to, to, a, to a place under the attacker's control. Um, there's the uh, navigation um, console map showing the sh showing the uh, deviation. And the hardware cost here, at the time these guys did it, was about $2,000. So $2,000 investment to take over uh, tens of millions of dollars ship. Um, and this stuff has only come down in price since then. So um, at DEF CON 23, um, a Chinese group demonstrated um, a low-cost GPS simulator using a Blade RF, um, and they... Uh, Show, demonstrated it by taking it to a car showroom and uh, putting the navigation systems of the cars in the middle of a lake somewhere. Um, and it's even cheaper than that than that now. So you can do, if you want to try this at home, you can build your own GPS spoofer with a Hack RF1. Um, you'll need to add an external oscillator to it because the built-in oscillator on the Hack RF1 is not um, precise enough. So you need to add a 10 megahertz low drift oscillator which uh, you know will, will cost you five or ten extra dollars, um, and make a little daughter board for it. Uh, there's what the daughter board looks like, and that's what it looks like installed. Um, and then you download the daily GPS ephemeris data that NASA kindly posts every single day. Um, so this is basically a replay attack. You're taking uh, the satellite configuration from the day before, essentially, um, and sending out a new signal. But you can adjust the time signal, so um, you can use that that 
previous ephemeris data, but give it a current time. So you can still do an attack that a time check won't notice. Um, and then one of the open source projects that's out there to generate the GPS uh, radio signals is GPS SDR SIM. So you can go to GitHub and get that. So for under $500, um, you can have your very own GPS spoofer. Uh, and that can be fun to do things like um, take down uh, consumer drones, which have no-fly zone capability. So here I am uh, spoofing GPS, saying that uh, the drone is in the middle of, a, of an airport, uh, which are all no-fly no zones. Major airports all over the world are in the no-fly zone database. And um, it thinks about it for a little while, and then it, the auto landing function um, takes over, and the, the, the UAV lands. So you can go where people are flying drones, and uh, mess with them for, for your $500 investment. Uh, moving on to LiDAR. Uh, LiDAR is basically a scanning laser rangefinder. Uh, so these things were originally um, used for industrial monitoring, right? For no-go zones in factories and so on. Um, and the robot people were like, oh, these are cool, right? These give you like, um, in, the, in case of the early ones, they give you a line uh, of distances. And then the new ones... Um, give you multiple lines, 360 degrees. Um, the, the laser is mechanically scanned uh, across to give you that line. Um, and so the, the autonomous vehicles primarily use them for collision avoidance and map building. Um, LIDARs are, are also um, able to be DOSed and also spoofed. So for denial, um, you can actively overpower them, right? So you, sh you figure out what frequency they're operating on uh, and fire a laser back at them uh, at that same frequency and a high power, and it just dazzles them. Um, and it prevents them getting a return signal uh, um, from the environment. Uh, you can also prevent a return signal by covering things in absorbent material. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, and then spoofing, you can uh, also manipulate the absorbance and reflectivity, and then you can also um, send out active laser pulses to spoof these, and I'll cover that in a sec. Um, once again, each individual beam in a LiDAR is basically a 2D sensor, uh, so it's highly orientation dependent. Um, so that means if the vehicle tilts, like in the case of uh, this two-wheeled pizza delivery vehicle, um, then what the... LiDAR sees can change dramatically. Uh, and it also means that it can, um, if it's looking at a, an incline, like a hill, that can look like an obstacle. And it also means if it scans over the top of uh, a low obstacle, like a curb, uh, it can totally miss that. And we definitely drove that vehicle um, into curves, curbs and crashed it several times. Um, LiDAR is an active sensor, so it Sends out, a pul sends out pulses, and it can only see what returns a signal back to the unit. Um, so if it gets no return, it assumes nothing's there. Uh, so think about that. Everything over the horizon, up in the air, everything out of the LIDAR's range returns no signal. So most of the world returns nothing to the LIDAR. You have big, big gaps all the time. Um, things that absorb... Uh, the laser radiation in, in that frequency also look like nothing, uh, as well as transparent objects. So what that means is uh, if you have a system that's primary guidance is LiDAR, uh, you can literally do the Wile E. Coyote thing where you paint an absorbent thing on a wall and the vehicle will happily run straight into the wall if it, think, if it thinks it's trying to go down a passageway. Um, and you can also make obstacles uh, that transmit light at the right frequency and it will run right into them. Um, now, again, it's all about what gets returned to the sensor. So things that reflect light can also confuse the laser. So, for example, uh, puddles on the ground, because that reflects things off. Uh, one of the effects of that is that things that are actually far away, because they're reflected back, they can look close by. So it can think that far away <laughs> things are obstacles. Um, and then if, in, if there's nothing in the way, if it's just reflecting off into the atmosphere, you've got a big hole where that puddle is. So it looks it's indistinguishable from a hole in the ground. Um, so that's one of the problems um, with operating driverless vehicles uh, that mostly use LiDAR in the rain. Um, one of the DARPA Grand Challenge vehicles, which I won't say which one, 
ran right into a new black SUV because the black SUV was uh, so reflective that it just saw a big hole there. Um, here's just an interesting thing that I found uh, on the internet um, in my travels. This is a, a document that was captured from uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Mali. And, and this item number two is referring to GPS jamming uh, with a Russian uh, GPS jamming unit. And item number three is uh, talking about attaching reflective panels to vehicles to um, deal with uh, um, laser designators. So that's just, just interesting that it's, that it's uh, definitely on adversarial technique lists. Uh, reflectance is also used as a feature uh, for doing things like road line detection. So uh, the fact that the white paint on the road is very reflective, the GPS return has gaps that can be shape mapped uh, to road lines. So what that means is that um, in a system that uses that technique, you can paint black on black and you can make fake road markings that are invisible to the human but very visible to the vehicle. So, you know, you can make it do kind of weird behavior uh, with, your, with your fake road, road markings or even maybe just attack the map and uh, annoy the engineers back, back at home base by writing messages to them on the road. Uh, things that look solid uh, are assumed to be solid, so you can make obstacles um, that a human would not be fooled by, but the system would be fooled by. Um, and uh, anyway, that, that's that, that's neither here nor there, really. But uh, you you can definitely make a class of obstacles that humans would ignore uh, that robots wouldn't. Um, getting into denial and spoofing. Um, so you can actually selectively overpower the LiDAR with a, with a very strong laser source. So here's an example uh, from Keist uh, showing that they were, this is a multi-beam Velodyne LiDAR and they were able to point a laser at it and selectively uh, remove a return. So basically hiding an obstacle um, using a, a, strong, a strong laser source. Um, here's a bit more interesting result from the same paper um, that we can spoof uh, obstacles by using a weaker source. And this takes advantage of the fact that the glass on most LiDAR units is curved. So it actually refracts incoming radiation inwards that, uh, in a way that's dependent on the source strength. So what this means is that uh, you can do basically a drive-by attack where you point your uh, spoofing LiDAR at a vehicle from the side and fake returns in front of it. So you could cause it to stop um, even though you, the attacker, are to the side of it. Um, and so here's some results showing that uh, using a, a weaker source, um, there's a particular angle, uh, like 20 degrees off beam, showing um, uh, where the false returns are. But as you modulate that strength higher, uh, we can induce fake dots that are well off axis from the, the attacker's location. Um, here's an even more sophisticated spoofing attack. This is doing a relay attack, um, which is where you actually uh, set up an active receiver to measure the LiDAR's location and pulse characteristics and then send in fake returns. So LiDAR obvi obviously operates at the speed of light. You can't intercept a pulse and send back a fake one, but what you can do is anticipate them because the pulse rate is regular. So what you do is you uh, characterize the timing of the unit that's being attacked and then you start sending your fake pulses just ahead of the ones that it's really expecting back. So timing is critical, um, but again, we can change the effective location of our spoofed returns. Um, so showing here, uh, inducing returns that are further away than the attacker, um, and then inducing returns that are closer than the attacker by changing the timing characteristics of our fake pulses. Now, this, this is a, a pretty expensive attack in terms of um, you know, the placement and characterization of the sensor, but it is theoretically possible. Um, now, some vehicles that are out there on the roads right now uh, don't use LiDAR at all. Um, Tesla, in particular, has been very vocal about the fact that they think everything sh should be done with cameras. Um, so here's the way that the cameras are set up on the Tesla. They have one millimeter wave radar for long distance um, obstacle detection. Uh, so let's say, say a little bit about cameras. Um, they're mostly used for specialized object detection, such as signs and lane markings. Um, they uh, sometimes use stereo to get a depth map. Uh, not so often, uh, sometimes used to what's called colorize the LiDAR. Um, so I think I have a 
video of that here. This is what enabled Stanley to win the second DARPA Grand Challenge. It was able to drive much faster than it should have been able to just using the LiDAR because the LiDAR range is shorter than the vision. But what the system did was it looked at the LiDAR information and decided what color a go, no-go zone looked like, and then it extended that go zone as far ahead as the cameras could see. So, you know, the go zone has more than just the road on it, um, but the road, the center of that extends a long way. So it was able to drive at very high speed, and that was the main reason that it won. Um, cameras can uh, be dosed easily with bright lights, um, and they can be spoofed in various ways, but mostly including uh, the the um, same camouflage techniques that work for confusing human vision, um, exploiting assumptions about what color things are, um, and the use of repeating patterns in the case of stereo cameras. Uh, so here's a few things that uh, have been sort of in the news recently about cameras, um, uh, especially when it comes to deep learning recognition models. So this was a famous paper um, of about ad adding adversarial spots to uh, street signs that caused them not to be recognized. Um, this this paper was was sort of fun, uh, but the, it all depends on exactly the model that's being attacked, and so it depends on the knowledge of the model. Uh, here's another one where uh, they add noise to an image that causes the things in the image uh, not to be recognized anymore, but you have to have a foothold on the platform to do that. You have, have to have access to the image stream. Um, so these techniques so far are generally basically white box techniques. You know everything about the system, and you know specifically how to target that particular machine learning model, but a different model wouldn't be susceptible to it. Um, and they usually don't work reliably in the face of parametric distortion. So these signs that were like nicely front on uh, would fool the system, but not necessarily a sign that was more side on. Uh, but here's a, a fun model that did work well in the case of parametric distortions. These were models that were 3D printable. So these turtles uh, were able to confuse a, a, vision, a machine learning vision system into thinking they were rifles, and they were robust to all kinds of parametric distortions. Uh, but again, totally depends on that one model and knowledge of that model. Um, here's some more real world examples. Um, of attacking cameras. So this is from Tencent Keen Lab, uh, showing the fragility of some of the discriminators of the, in this case, um, uh, I think it was a Tesla autopilot system. So real world blurring of lane markers showed that if you distort the lane marker enough, uh, it doesn't get recognized. That's kind of not that surprising really. Um, a more interesting result here is that they put just a few small dots on the road and that was enough for the car to think it was a lane marker and to change lanes when it saw it. So um, false detection of things in the environment uh, is, is like relatively easy to do with the cameras. Uh, here's a great one from earlier this year, uh, very recent actually, June 2019. Um, these guys uh, caused a car to, uh, uh, they looked at an automated driver assistance system, so not a fully autonomous vehicle, but an ADAS, um, and they were able to put ephemeral fake traffic control features. So um, here's the victim vehicle. They projected fake speed limit signs on local infrastructure uh, using a drone. Um, and that projection, in order to fool the vehicle, can be extremely brief. Right? Hundreds of milliseconds is enough for the vehicle to register it. Uh, but the human, who's the, who's the actual you know, sort of safety pilot here, may not notice what's happened at all and just get really confused. Um, so they tested it on a particular ADAS system, and there's uh, showing that it was fooled by the fake speed limit sign. Uh, millimeter wave radar is another sensor that's being used in vehicle applications. So this is the stuff that you see at the airport um, that lets the airport security people uh, see under your clothes. And it's primarily used for collision avoidance. So it's lower resolution than the LiDAR system, but it, um, it's also much cheaper. Most things in the world are very reflective to the millimeter wave radar, um, and you can uh, do denial and spoofing uh, with jamming um, and with things that fool radars like metal chaff um, and like and big sheets of metal that make huge uh, radar reflectance, like overhead signs. Um, so here was a, an attack that was presented at DEF CON 24, um, jamming a, uh, this is a Bosch LRR3 millimeter wave radar system that's used in many of these autopilot uh, systems. Um, so they use a lot of equipment here to do it. Um, here's the results showing a Tesla autopilot uh, 
being successfully jammed and not seeing an object that's in front of it. Um, to do that, in addition to the sensor, they had an oscilloscope, a signal analyzer, a signal generator, a harmonic mixer, and a frequency multiplier. So about $100,000 worth of equipment to perform this attack. Now you could say maybe this stuff will come down in cost, but that's, you know, it's not an easy attack to do in terms of cost. Um, they also theorized spoofing and relay attacks, but didn't perform them. Um, the inertial measurement unit, um, which often includes a compass as part of the package, um, is a unit that contains accelerometers and gyros uh, and integrates those output to give you um, odometry and things like that. These can be either very expensive, like the ones you get on aircraft, uh, or very cheap. You can get these little hobbyist single board ones for a few dollars. Um, in many systems, uh, many aerial systems especially, they're the primary navigation sensor. Uh, sorry, many underwater systems. I have a slide in that in a second. And you can get very high fidelity models. So, for example, 0.1% of distance traveled is cumulative ever, uh, error. That's like if you have a Boeing 777 IMU, it means that you travel 300 kilometers and your distance error at the end is 300 meters. So that's not bad, especially um, you know if you're sending some underwater vehicle uh, under the ice and you just need to retrieve it when it comes out. Um, they're very difficult to interfere with um, because they're self-contained and uh, they just deal with the motion of the platform. Um, if you can get right up against them, you can do physical attacks with magnetic fields and thermal drift and stuff like that. But they're basically un unattackable um, without getting really close, which is why the military uses them as primary sensors for their aerial vehicles. But there is one really interesting attack that you don't have to be right up against it to do, and that's um, an acoustics attack on the MEMS, the microelectronical microelectromechanical micro systems uh, gyros. So this is a little tiny chip that has a piece in it that's vibrating, and so it has a resonant frequency. So if you can vibrate this uh, from an external acoustic source at that resonant frequency, you can make it go crazy. Um, so here's uh, a, a paper on that that was successfully uh, POC'd uh, with a flying multi-rotor UAV. So there's a graph of the control inputs to the four rotors of the quad rotor, and when it's blasted with this acoustic noise, um, the controller goes crazy, as you can see. So if you can get, if you have a, a sound source that's loud enough, you could do this at a distance of several meters. Um, so that's a potential counter drone uh, device. And then wheel odometry is another part of uh, what we call dead reckoning. Um, so these are good to know your true speed and when you're stopped. And the failure of wheel odometers uh, it can easily cause the vehicle to stop. So here's our own pizza delivery vehicle, and it tries to negotiate this turn on one attempt, and it actually scrapes against this wall. You can see lots of human piloted vehicles have also done that, um, and it scraped off a wheel encoder, and that successfully confused the vehicle and made it stop. Um, so you can attack odometers by uh, trying to scrape them off, or also um, doing things like changing the wheel diameter or having a slippery surface. And then last one uh, I'll cover is ultratonic sensors, which are mostly used for parking, um, and they're only used at low speeds, so they're really not that interesting of a sensor to mess with. Um, but these use acoustic pulses, so you can do um, the same sort of attacks. Um, you can jam them by sending acoustic noise, uh, you can spoof them by sending fake acoustic pulses, and you can also do a cancellation attack where you characterize the sensor and you send an opposite pulse at the same time uh, and cancel them out. Uh, these attacks are extremely low cost because you only need a, um, an ultrasonic transducer, uh, but they're also extremely low impact because this, is, this sensor is only used while parking. So. You know, if you're James Bond and you want to go up against autonomous vehicles, um, you know, what would, what would Bond's vehicle have in it? Um, a GPS jammer, of course, uh, smoke and dust and vapor generator for, uh, the light up for LIDARs, uh, lightweight decoy obstacles, chaff for the radar, transparent caltrops, um, and of course, every James Bond vehicle has to have an oil slick, and then a more modern Bond, um, might have an active LiDAR jammer and spoofer, an active radar jammer, uh, an acoustic blaster for dealing with drones, um, and a, a, its own drone to project signs and lane markers. Um, and then just one quick thing that's just been released uh, that possibly could be an, unspoof, an effectively unspoofable sensor for autonomous vehicles is uh, localizing ground penetrating radar. So this uh, is something that's mounted under the vehicle that collects uh, information about the subsurface structure, 
which obviously doesn't change very often, right? What's under the ground uh, is not really susceptible to change from the weather uh, and so on. Um, and it compares it with a map. So it does require a pre-computed uh, pre, uh, subsurface map to compare against, but that's really not that big a deal because we're already mapping the uh, pretty much the entire world uh, on ter in terms of roads. So you would just need to go over and remap everything, but it doesn't change nearly as often as the above surface uh, stuff. And you can achieve with this system uh, four centimeters accuracy at speed at 100 kilometers per hour. Um, so this is primarily suggested for lane keeping in the presence of snow, right? When you can't see the lane markings, that's the uh, designed application for it. Um, but it also could be used as a high security, um, uh, unspoofable sensor. Um, the map is an important, very important uh, part of this whole system. Um, most deployed systems right now place a great emphasis on pre-acquired map data. Um, and they, it's often considered that the map that's been built, built up is the reference ground truth, right? So Google's going out there, it's mapping everything with LiDAR and saying like, oh, well, that's how the world is, right? Because that means the vehicle itself has to do much less uh, recognition load. Um, in, in particular, looking at traffic control elements like traffic lights uh, and things like what's vegetation and can be driven over uh, versus what can't. Um, so here's a quick thing about traffic lights. If you know where they all are, a camera just has to look in the right place every time. Um, but that means also that uh, if you put fakes that aren't in the map, um, then the human's going to get worried, but the robot's going to ignore them. Um, in the case of vegetation, colorized LIDAR is often used uh, with some sort of transmission classifier. Um, and so overhanging foliage, so stuff that's grown since the map was made, can confuse the vehicle because its um, colorized LIDAR is disagreeing with what's in the map. So dependence on the map may exacerbate the brittleness of our discrimination rules. Um, so one just last thing on the map, um, it's, uh, it needs to be updated all the time. And so if it's local, then it's vulnerable to unexpected real world features. But if it's remote and the map's being updated remotely, then you can jam map updates uh, or you can MITM them. So that's where the network sort of comes into play. So if you're looking at exploiting logic structures, um, a goal it would be to maximize the uncertainty of the, of the vehicle. So cause it to require manual assistance, confuse and annoy its occupants, inconvenience the other road users. And as the attacker, you should concentrate on fragile maneuvers like right turns that are blocked by other cars into traffic. Um, if you're the attacker, you also have access to the map. If you're also able to track the vehicle, then you can choose the time and place of your attack uh, to hopefully cause some sort of an, an accident, uh, ideally. Um, and I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to just quickly talk about uh, the different logic attacks. Um, so you tra you're trapping the robot in a situation it can't get out of, redirecting it to where you want it to go, um, or causing it to crash into things uh, are, are sort of obvious categories of attacks um, that uh, uh, can be done. Um, I'm just going to quickly skip the stuff that I had right at the end. I was going to talk about some connected vehicle stuff, but let me just close uh, with this one slide here, uh, which is research from earlier this year from Georgia Tech. So they used uh, percolation theory to determine the network effects of a large-scale hack of connected vehicles in, in New York, in Manhattan. Um, so this is uh, in terms of the access to the street map that those vehicles had. So here is what the roads in Manhattan look like with no hacked vehicles. Um, if you can hack 10% uh, of the vehicles at rush hour, suddenly a lot of the island is basically inaccessible. Um, and if you can get to 20%, uh, you just can completely uh, block physical connectivity on an entire on an entire uh, large city and prevent emergency services from responding, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's it's a it's a big deal, especially in the case of connected vehicles, to make sure we get things right uh, and that that twenty percent figure uh, is something that's not really attainable. But in closing. Uh, driverless vehicles are cool. Don't do any of the things that I talked about. Um, don't, don't hassle uh, the Hoff, or rather don't hacksaw the bots. 
um, and use this information to think about ways that we can design better systems, um, you know, keep adversarial hacking in the discussion. Uh, and then we can maybe live the dream of the car driving itself while you shag. Thanks for your attendance. Uh, well, uh, thanks for waking us up. <laughs> you, uh, you were right. I totally did go over by five minutes. I, I apologize. That. I told you we were going to do that. Um, any, my God, all these people appeared from somewhere. Yes. Thanks. That was great stuff. Um, what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> Actually, I, um, I live in a city that has really good public transportation, so I gave away my car years ago. <laughs> And that, that's the reason, right? That you're not afraid of, of self-driving cars? Um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of them, but, uh, I, you know, I think that ultimately they will, you know, uh, solve a lot of problems, right, that we have right now with, uh, with transportation, but uh, we've got to get there first. You know, there's a lot, a lot of things that have to be solved to make that happen. But, uh, you know, ultimately it will, they will make the, they'll make the roads safer and also... All the other applications um, that I mentioned that aren't just driving, you know, like li all the logistics, um, all the mappings and science, you know, like uh, autonomous vehicles are going to do great things for our ability to characterize um, oceans and other parts of the natural world that we just can't do, uh, we just can't afford to do with uh, vehicles with humans in them. Great. Thanks. Okay. Any more, any more questions or? Okay, well, thank you very much. Great talk. <laughs> <laughs>